Welcome to Blockchain Buzz Africa Coding Wednesdays. So today we are going to talk about blockchain fundamentals and core concepts. So this involves basically theory of what blockchain is before we jump to practicals. So in today's session, we are going to learn mostly the core concepts about blockchain. So what is blockchain? Blockchain is technology is a distributed database or ledger of transactions shared among a computer network nodes. So let's talk about what is the main objective in this case of Ethereum. The main objective of Ethereum is to accept transactions from accounts, update their state and maintain this state as current until another transaction updates again. So let's talk about one of the core concepts of blockchain, which is, which is cryptography. Cryptography is basically the science of converting a plain text into secret, a hidden meaningful text. Also, it helps in transmitting and storing data that cannot be easily deciphered using basically on keys. So when you talk about types of cryptography, we have two types of cryptography. You have symmetric cryptography and asymmetric cryptography. So what is symmetric cryptography? Symmetric cryptography refers to the process of uh, using a single key for both encryption and decryption. So this means that the same key should be available to multiple people if they want to exchange messages using this form of cryptography. And the next thing is asymmetric cryptography. This refers to a process of using two keys for both encryption and decryption. So any of these keys can be used for both encryption and decryption. Cryptography is basically a wide topic. So this is just basically an introduction and we are going to talk more as a separate topic on its own of, about cryptography. So let's talk about blockchain and Ethereum architecture. So blockchain architecture comprises of multiple components. So it is in the way these components interact with each other that basically makes a blockchain very, very unique. So one of the, some of those components, Ethereum components that are going to talk about includes the Ethereum virtual machine. So think of the EVM, Ethereum virtual machine, as an execution runtime for an Ethereum network that is responsible for providing a runtime that can execute code written in smart contracts. EVM can access accounts, both contracts and externally owned accounts, which we're going to look at later, and has its own storage data. It does not have access to the overall ledger, but does have limited information about the current transaction. So the figure above shows Ethereum virtual machine. Not when a transaction is submitted, it's not executed immediately. It is pooled in a transaction pool known as mempool. So these transactions are not yet written to the Ethereum ledger until mining basically starts. Now let's take a look at Ethereum component number two, which is basically the miner. In addition to what we have just discussed, miners are responsible for writing transactions to the Ethereum chain. They are interested in writing transactions to a ledger because of the rewards associated with it. So some of the rewards for writing a block to the chain and, uh, uh, and gas fees from all the transactions in the block. So miners have mining nodes. So what are mining nodes? So these nodes represent computers that are connected using a peer-to-peer -peer protocol to form the Ethereum network. So how do miners mine transactions? Basically miners compete to solve a complex algorithm puzzle using their computation power. The miner who solves the puzzle first writes the blockchain containing transaction to his own ledger and sends the block announced value to other miners for verification. Once verified and accepted, the new block is written to all ledgers belonging to the miners. So let's take a deep dive into how mining basically works. So you can see on the diagram, that uh, we have a few uh, working components that basically integrate together with the mining process. So basically when transactions are submitted to the mempool, 
those miners using their mining nodes, in this case computers, will create a new block, collect all transactions from the transaction pool known as the mempool we discussed earlier, and then check if the transaction are not already written to, the, to a block and add them to the newly created block. Finally, this block is added to the chain and they get rewards out of this. So there is a note that says basically blocks are contains of a blocks are containers for a transaction. A block contains multiple transactions, and each block has different transactions based on the gas limit and block size, which we are going to look at a bit later. So these blocks are chained together to form a blockchain. Gas limit basically determines the maximum gas allowed. This helps in determining how many transactions can be part of the block. So let's look at component number three, which is basically transaction. So what is a transaction? Transaction is basically an agreement between a buyer and a seller where they will exchange assets. So there are types of transactions that can be executed by Ethereum. This includes transfer of Ether from one account to another these accounts can be externally owned accounts or contract accounts. Deployment of a smart contract, e.g. an externally owned account can deploy a contract using a transaction in EVM. Using or invoking a function within a contract, so this basically means executing a function in a contract that changes the state is considered a transaction in Ethereum. So let's look at the properties of a transaction. A transaction basically has properties. So this includes the from property. This property describes the account that is originating the transaction and represents an account ready to send some ether. With this can be either an externally owned account or a contract account. So the two property, the two property refers to an account that is receiving ether. Input. So input refers to the compiled contract bytecode and is used during contract deployment in the Ethereum virtual machine. Also used for storing data related to smart contract function calls along with, the, with its parameters. So let's talk about gas price. Gas price basically is a property of a transaction that refers to the price per gas the sender was willing to pay in way. The total gas is computed as gas units multiplied by gas price, which we're going to look at uh, later on the units of conversion in Ethereum. Let's talk about block hash. So block, block hash refers to the hash of blocks to which this transaction belongs. Block number is a property that refers to the block in which a transaction belongs. Gas. Gas refers to the amount of gas supplied by the sender who is executing the transaction. So some of those properties of a transaction include the hash, which refers to the hash of the transaction that is actually submitted by an externally owned account or a contract. Nouns, this is a property that refers to the number of transactions made by the sender prior to the current transaction. Basically, the total number of transactions made by an external account or a contract account. Transaction index, so this refers to the serial number of the current transaction in the block. So this includes cryptographic properties of VRS which refers to properties relating to digital signatures and the signing of that transaction, which we're going to look more in depth in future tutorials. So now having discussed about the properties of a transaction, are you ready to get started? So let's see how an end to end transaction works and how it flows through the multiple components and gets included or stored in the blockchain. So case scenario, Henry wants to send a digital asset, say ether, to Looper, Henry generates a transaction message containing the from, which includes basically the person sending the transaction to the person receiving the transaction, 
value amount that is to be received. So these fields uh, are, are included and they, they are sent across the Ethereum network. So the transaction gets broadcasted into a transaction pool, which you mentioned earlier, known as the mempool. So the miner notices this transaction in, in his node and creates a new block and takes all those transactions that uh, are in the pool, honoring the gas limit criteria and adds them to the block. So this activity is done by all miners also who sold the same transaction in the network. So Henry transaction will also be part of this process. So these miners compete trying to solve the challenge thrown to them. So the miner, the winner is the miner who solves the challenge uh, first after a period of seconds. And then one of the miners will advertise that they have found a solution to the challenge and, they, and, they, that, and that they are the winner and they should write the block to the chain. So the winner sends the challenge solution along with the new mine block to all the other miners in the network for validation and verification. And once they have, they are certified by the other miners that they indeed is the solution is correct and that the original miner cracked the challenge, they accept the new block containing Henry's transaction and they append this to their instance of the ledger. So this generates a new block on the chain that is persisted across time and space during this time, these accounts of both properties, parties, this includes the person who sent the transaction, which is Henry, and the receiver, who is Looper, is updated. So finally, the block is replicated across every node on the network and persisted. So that marks the end of our fundamentals uh, session. So on the next tutorial, we are going to look at more detailed uh, on what uh, these properties are by actually doing the practical. See you next time.